at the crime scene, the officers there informed me that the uh, two victims were inside, that there was uh, the residents, uh, Jose and Kitty Menendez, uh, killed apparently by a shotgun blast, and the sons were the ones that had found them. Went in, it, it had an eerie stillness about the room, but everywhere. Uh, the victims themselves, the bodies, were just a mess. They were just torn to pieces by the shotgun blast. Body parts blown from them that was on the floor behind them. It was actually on the ceiling, on the wall behind them. First time that I saw Eric and Lyles, when they came back to the house after their interview, it was about 5.30 in the morning, and they wanted to obtain some property from the crime scene. And I wasn't uh, ready to relinquish the crime scene to them, so I had them come back at 8.30. My impression was is they certainly didn't seem upset that their parents had been murdered. They seemed to be very well composed at that point. That certainly set off some lights in my mind. I was at the aunt's house, Aunt Terry Baralt, interviewing she and her husband, and I had mentioned that it's been very hard to get hold of Eric and Lyle to interview them, to re-interview them. There was a lot of questions I had to ask them. And Terry said, well, wait, Eric's here now, would you like me to wake him up and you can interview him? <laughs> well, of course. He started asking me questions about uh, witness protection programs and that concerned me, so I gave him information that seemed to please him. Dr. Ozeal felt that he had been threatened by them and to protect himself made tapes of the interviews and then subsequently made a tape of the interview with the brothers' voices on the tape. It's just something you can see on Murder, She Wrote every week, but looking back on it, uh, you can see how it may have been motivation or at least um, a plot similar to what happened that night. Eric walked me in, into the foyer, which was just outside the library, uh, and asked if I wanted to know what happened. And I said yes, and he started walking me through exactly what happened that night. His brother swung the door open and shot his father, and Eric shot his mom, and he was explaining how blood and skin were landing all over the place. About three weeks after uh, I told the police about the confession, uh, that they asked me to wear a body wire, and um, essentially I'd get Eric to confess. And when he finally showed up, um, you know, I had a little bit of tension, but we sat down, and he said, you didn't go to the police with what I told you, did you? And I said, yeah, right, I went to the police. Um, so he didn't actually come out and confess, but he implied that he had confessed at one point. They had been involved in the purchase of a, a, uh, a chain of video stores on the uh, East Coast that uh, ideally were supposed to have some connections to uh, mafia families in New York or somewhere in the Eastern area. And you couple this whole thing around and you know how aggressive he was with his business tactics that uh, it became plausible. I went into uh, the jail and asked them, um, and Lyle told me uh, that uh, it just wasn't true, that they're not, the police are not doing their job. And uh, at the time, I was convinced that the prosecution had been a mistake. In October of 1989, Eric Menendez confessed to killing his parents with Lyle, he, and he confessed to Dr. Ozeal. So what Dr. Ozeal did is he requested that Eric call his brother Lyle and ask Lyle to come to the office so that Dr. Ozeal could actually gauge uh, what reaction Lyle had to this confession. When Lyle arrived at Dr. Ozeal's office and was told by Eric that he had confessed to the killings to Dr. Ozeal, Lyle was very upset and he was pacing around saying, well, what are we gonna do now? Now we're gonna have to get rid of Dr. Ozeal too. Claiming that their parents were child molesters uh, made it very difficult for us as a prosecution team because normally we prosecute child molesters. Ozeal was testifying about premeditation evidence. It was not true. And so in order to show that the information he's giving is not true, you have to show he's not a truth teller. Within a minute before the shooting, there was what he interpreted to be an overt threat of attack from his father with his mother's complicity. At that point, fear turned to panic. So we don't write the defenses. We don't make them up. We don't 
This isn't screenwriting. This isn't playwriting. You take what you get from your client. Decided only those things that were operating on their conscious minds that week was admissible. Well, that's ridiculous. The unconscious mind probably dictates more of our feelings than the conscious mind. That was just an arbitrary ruling. First, we had our hands tied behind us, our back. Then we had our legs shackled. Then somebody cut us off at the knees. <laughs> then our eyes were gouged out. It was a, it was a horrible, depressing, frightening progression. Eric had promised him, uh, you'll never have to do this again after the first trial. Lau Menendez took no joy in bringing these things to the public attention. He had to in the first trial. Uh, it did not seem necessary in the second trial. It seemed uh, duplicative. People across the country, I think, were stunned a little bit by the verdicts in the, in the first trial. And I think it was important to show the people in this country, as, and the people in this county in particular, that justice can be achieved in cases such as this. What the judge was able to do was to keep out a lot of trivia, but mountains of trivia. And that was very important. It kept the jury from being distracted from the real issues in this case, which were the defendant's state of mind at the time of the commission of the crime. It demonstrated that uh, Kitty Menendez, for example, was on her back, lying on the floor at the time that most of the shots were fired to her body. So it demonstrated that these victims were not in any way a threat to the defendants. It was garbage to come in and tell a jury that in a complicated shooting scene where 10, 12 shotgun blasts are expended, which shot was fired first, from which gun in what direction, and whether the victim was standing, turning, sitting, laying at the time they were received, it was laughable. He solicited perjury from his former girlfriend, Jamie Prasarsik, and he wanted her to falsely allege that his father had sexually assaulted her. This jury was able to hear that evidence. We have a retrial. There's no mystery to the defense anymore. When you walk into a case, usually there's a little bit of surprise in how the defense is going to play out. And the tape just played along with several police interviews and, and the 911 call. It was almost perfunctory the way they went around it because this evidence had taken up weeks and weeks to build the foundations to get in to it in the first trial. And it was just like boom, boom, boom. And just in the way that David Kahn put the question to Eric was, now, you have described this woman as a middle-aged, depressed, alcoholic housewife, correct? And he progressively led him to the point, and you were afraid of this middle-aged, drunken, alcoholic, depressed housewife, correct? And Eric had to say yes. Usually when you have an imperfect self-defense, it's a situation where somebody is pointing a gun at you and it's a starter pistol or somebody makes a mistake, um, they see what they think is a movement that's threatening and it's really not. Somebody is misjudging what is happening right then and there. 